let's investigate the derivative of the sine function experimentally, analytically, and geometrically. Let's consider the function f of x equals sine of x. We can graph this function on the axis here. We can plot a single point on the curve and draw the tangent line to the curve at that point. Moreover, we can measure the slope of this tangent line. As we move the point along the curve, we see that the tangent line changes, and so the slope of the tangent line varies. But as we move the point, we can see that the slope of the tangent line varies everywhere between negative 1 and 1. Let's be a little bit more specific, and on a second axis system, let's plot the slopes of the tangent lines as we move along the curve f of x equals sine of x. As we do this, we see that the slopes map out the graph of a function. This function looks like it could be the cosine function. So we might guess that the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. But can we be sure? One way to check is to use the definition of the derivative, where we see that the derivative of sine of x is given by the limit as h goes to 0 of sine of x plus h minus sine of x over h. Using the sine sum angle formula, we see that this is equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of sine of x times cosine of h plus cosine of x times sine of h minus sine of x all over h. Then we can rearrange the terms in the numerator of this fraction. We can split the fraction into the sum of two fractions and recognize that the limit of a sum is equal to the sum of two limits, as shown here. In the first limit, the sine of x is constant with respect to h, so the limit becomes the sine of x times the limit as h goes to 0 of cosine h minus 1 over h. And in the second limit, the cosine of x is constant, so this limit becomes cosine of x times the limit as h goes to 0 of sine of h over h. From here, we can use geometric reasoning to show that the limit as h goes to 0 of cosine h minus 1 divided by h is 0, and the limit as h goes to 0 of sine of h over h is 1. Therefore, this quantity equals the cosine of x. So we see that the derivative of the sine function is equal to the cosine function. Because the two important limits follow geometrically, can we just see this derivative fact visually on the unit circle? Let's find out by investigating the unit circle, but only in the first quadrant as shown here. That is, take a radius of length 1 and draw a quarter circle in the first quadrant. Now imagine that we take a dot and we rotate a certain fixed angle called theta. Let's label the coordinates of the point x0 and y0 so that this triangle shown here has a width of x0 and a height of y0. Let's label the angle complementary to theta by alpha. Recall that by definition, the coordinate y0 is the sine of the angle theta. Also, notice that when we draw that horizontal line, since theta and alpha are complementary, this angle here is theta as well. Now let's imagine we take our radius and we rotate some small angle labeled delta theta. It turns out that the point created on the radius now forms a new y-coordinate, and the distance between that and the old y-coordinate we'll call delta y. We use the two points on the circle to create this triangular wedge that has an arc length of delta theta and a height of delta y. Notice that the triangular wedge is not actually a triangle as it has a curved side length. But if we start shrinking delta theta, as we do here, we see that the triangular wedge region starts to become more and more like an actual triangle. And sure enough, the smaller that we shrink delta theta, the more this triangular wedge region resembles an actual triangle. The triangle that that triangular wedge approaches has a hypotenuse perpendicular to the circle at the point x0, y0. This means that one of the non-right angles is complementary to theta according to this picture, so that it's an angle of alpha, making that triangle similar to the original right triangle mapped out by x0, y0. This means that the triangular wedge region has an angle mapped out by alpha, Remember that it also has a height of length delta y and the arc length of delta theta. Remember that dy d theta is approximately equal to delta y divided by delta theta. Because the triangular wedge region is approximately similar to the original triangle, we see that delta y divided by delta theta must be approximately equal to x0 divided by 1. But x0 is the x-coordinate on the unit circle for the angle theta, so it's given by cosine of theta. Now let's let the calculus take over. Remember that we want to take delta theta as close to 0 as possible. 
That means we want a limiting process as delta theta goes to zero. When we do that, we see that the triangular wedge region becomes almost exactly a triangle that's similar to that original triangle. What that means is that as delta theta goes to zero, we see that dy d theta, which is equal to the limit as delta theta goes to zero of delta y over delta theta, is actually equal to x zero over one, which is equal to cosine of theta. This means that if y equals the sine of theta, then the derivative dy d theta equals cosine of theta. So this geometric picture shown here has all the information we need to determine that the derivative of the sine function is the cosine function. For more calculus videos, check out my calculus playlist, and thanks for watching.